Welcome to today's webinar, Unlocking Profitable Growth in Your Services Business. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to each of today's speakers. Michael Fossett leads IDC's Software Business Solutions Group, which encompasses research and consulting in enterprise software applications, software partner and alliance ecosystems, software vendor business models, SaaS and cloud computing, among other areas. He also provides thought leadership in the area of social applications and the transition to the social business. Sean is the Chief Financial Officer of Navinet, with oversight for all of Navinet's financially related activities, including the development, implementation, and ongoing evaluation of the company's short and long-term financial objectives, compliance, and regulatory affairs. Navinet is the leading healthcare collaboration network connecting over 40 health plans and 60% of the nation's physicians, representing 420,000 clinical and administrative healthcare professionals. Navinet Open helps payers and providers boost care quality, lower costs, and improve population health management. Our final speaker today is Joe. Joe Longo brings 15 years of experience as an executive in charge of professional services organizations to his role as senior PSA specialist at NetSuite. Through numerous publications, Joe is a well-recognized professional services thought leader with an emphasis on the role of professional services automation solutions. Prior to joining NetSuite, Joe was VP of Professional Services at Cirrus Corp. He also held VP of Professional Services roles at Metricstream, Valacert, and World Talk Corporation. For those of you who aren't familiar with NetSuite, we are the largest publicly traded SaaS provider of integrated business management solutions. We operate around the world with more than 3,000 employees and generated over half a billion in revenue in the fiscal year 2014. NetSuite helps companies transform their operations so they can achieve their business vision. And over 24,000 organizations trust NetSuite to run their mission-critical operations. Now, we're not going to be demonstrating any product functionality today, but I think this slide does help to set the stage for the discussion. Today, you're going to be hearing from both professional services and finance leaders. We're going to discuss the benefits of leveraging services resource planning. Those are all of the service function components you see here on the right-hand side of the slide. But at the same time, we're also going to spend some time talking about the back office, the finance-related functions that are critical to any business. And to begin our discussion today, we'll hear from IDC. As, they share, uh, as Michael shares his insights around business life cycles within professional services. After that, we'll move on to our executive panel discussion. And of course, we've saved time at the end to answer your questions. So I encourage you to submit those through the WebEx Q&A panel throughout the webinar. And with that, Michael, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, I, should, uh, I should also say that, um, and, and thanks for that really, um, Fine bio and, uh, and introduction, but before uh, before my last nine years at um, at IDC, you know, running the enterprise software group, I um, I spent most of my career in software, running professional services in um, in software vendors, including Autodesk and uh, PeopleSoft and several Silicon Valley startups. So uh, when I when I came into the to this analyst role. Among other things, and I, you know, you heard the, the description. I have analysts who cover a broad set of uh, enterprise applications. But one of the things that I've always been really interested in, and in fact, had implemented at a few of those, um, you know, software vendors before I joined um, IDC, is this whole idea around um, how do we, you know, drive profitability? How do we manage professional services more effectively? So because of that. Over the last nine years, I've spent you know some time every year really um, trying to understand what's happening in this industry, uh, surveying and doing um, you know advisory work with both um, you know software vendors who who have solutions in the professional services space, but also uh, talking and trying to understand you know what the firms are really doing and and, and getting survey data around that. And you know as I've really um, looked at this over the last several years, I really started to, to get a clear picture in my mind of one of the easiest ways, I think, to look at your business and then to try to define the, the things that you need from a business perspective to help you operate more efficiently and effectively. Now, 
you know, all of us who've been in professional services know that, you know, it's a, it's a business that is driven by metrics and is a business that requires a laser focus on that data uh, and on your resources and on your clients. So if you think of all these as a life cycle uh, and, and the way they interrelate, I think it's a, it's a good way, and we'll dig into this a little bit more, but a good way to really think about your business. Now, <clears throat> but from an issue perspective, you know, we, we transitioned to this post-industrial information-driven or data-driven age. And, and so I think that there's an assumption that all our businesses should be data-driven. They should be, um, you know, it should be simpler to, um, to manage your business because there is so much data available. But in fact, what I see in most companies that I talk to is that it's just gotten more difficult, <clears throat> you know, besides the fact that there is a lot more data and it's really hard just to sort through that data and figure out what's relevant to you. Uh, there's also a lot of legacy uh, in your technology that makes this a lot more difficult. So in other words, there are a lot of data silos, application silos that create data silos, and there's even people silos. So if I want to do this analysis and, and, and manage my business to metrics, how do I get that data together? And then how do I get it to the right people? And, and what I see a lot, and, and when we survey, I see uh, that there's a real disconnect from the systems that you use to run your front office, so things around focused around your customer or your client, and the things that you use to run your uh, projects, so the project management systems, and the things that you use to manage your resources, and not just you know resource allocation and utilization and staffing, but also other important parts of that, like the H, uh, HR systems, uh, and, uh, and even the talent and performance management systems, and all of those things tend to be very disconnected today. And then, you know, from a system perspective, I was very surprised over the last few years have done some survey work um, internationally, actually, that shows that um, a lot of companies, a lot of professional services firms are still uh, building their own systems or, or, or they're living with systems that they built in the past, and those tend to be not well-maintained. And I you know, I, I have a lot of personal experience I could share about being my own worst client when I tried to build my own systems in the past. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, your resources get uh, called away and sent away to do all kinds of other work before you ever get things running or keep things running. And then I also see highly customized product-based systems trying to be force-fitted into this into this professional services world. And then lastly, just bad fit in general. So just not well-defined and not well understood and, and, and used correctly to give you this capability to manage your business more effectively. And then if you think about our business from a model perspective, you see two basic types of, of um, scenarios. The one that I've lived in the most really is this embedded scenario. So I often manage professional services inside of a product, a software product company uh, and in that situation, I needed, you know, project and resource-centric systems, of course, and I needed to manage all three life cycles, but I also had to integrate to product systems that were kind of the overarching corporate standard, whether that's front office, like CRM systems and HCM systems, so that I could integrate with sales so that I could get to, you know, the, the way to manage my people from a, a talent performance and skills perspective, all the way, you know, and, and into the back office, so finance and billing and, you know, how do I get that information in and how do I manage really complex contracts and systems that were really built to not manage those, but to manage, you know, selling a simple SKU and and um, and not managing all the terms and conditions and, and the rev rec rules that we deal with. And then in a standalone business, of course, it's even broader systems. So not only do you have to have those core things that you run or professional service automation kind of things that you use to run your system, your business, but you have to have the entire thing. So you have to be able to manage your financials. You have to be able to, to manage customers. You have to be able to manage resources and, and HR systems are required in that. So they, those all are there, and yet they often tend to be very disconnected. So, you know, if you think about um, these three life cycles, and we, we can talk about these. And I, I, I made this little um, flow chart, and I, I wanted to talk about some of these uh, details, but, but I, I don't think I captured every possible uh, thing that could be included under each of them, but I think it's a good place for us to start to focus just to think about the way that information has to flow when you're thinking about a project or when you're thinking about a client or when you're thinking about resources. So, you know, if, if, if just um, this piece of it, if you just focus on this piece of it for a minute, think about the, the problems that I see um, just at the front. So, you know, we get a, a request for a quote. 
uh, we have to respond to a, a, a quote with a proposal. And, you know, recently I was talking to a firm that, um, that had just implemented a integrated system that allowed them to bring in the, the resourcing into that proposal system so they could understand what staffing they had, so they could so they could see current resumes and make sure that resumes were updated in a very quick way. And that and that um, that firm told me that they had taken their response time from three weeks down to a couple of three days. And and because of that, they were able to uh, get a better proposal out in a much shorter period of time. But they were also able to respond to those uh, to those uh, requests for uh, quotes much more quickly, uh, and more of them because they had more bandwidth with the same amount of people. So. Integration and the capability to bring things like that together in this life cycle are really important. Um, the ability to get to data so that you can drive decisions off of that data is also a really critical piece. And you see I put on, on all of these cycles, I, under, on life cycles underneath that, I put this idea of data collection and analysis because it really does have to be integrated across your entire uh, life cycle and across all three of these life cycles and then interrelated in those because all of this data really drives the way you run the business. So, you know, if I get a request for a quote, do I bid that quote? How do I make that decision? Is it just based on, on, the, uh, on the skills of my uh, resources? Is it based on the availability and skills of my resources? Or in fact, could it be even deeper? Could you look at pro projects like that that you've done that were profitable or that perhaps weren't profitable? And, and over time, you can build this catalog of data that lets you make those decisions in a much more laser-focused way. So I know this is business that I've done profitably. I have the right resources. I can do this, and I have the capability to do this because I can see the utilization of the people I have. I can see the, the, the skills available, and I can soft book them. I can, can make this a, a reasonable business plan around each of these new projects that I want to bid, that I want to do, or I can cut business out that I know would not be profitable. If I've, if I've failed at this in the past or if I don't have the right skills available, then why bid things that can just cost you money? So so that, that data visibility up front is really important. But then as you go through this, it's also you know ex, uh, extremely important, <clears throat> not just from a, a contract perspective, but of course in the contracting itself, you need to be able to define the rubric. Um, you know, rules that you're going to apply and make sure that, that you understand the milestones, you understand the way you're going to build, the way you can recognize that revenue over time, because certainly it's a much more complex thing for us than it is for a, a product company that, you know, that is able to invoice and take the revenue when they actually transfer the product to the, to the, to the buyer. So, again, complexity and integration is really important in making sure that finance and professional services management is aligned in the way that that is, uh, is played out. Planning, same thing in planning, you need to be able to hard book uh, your resources against a plan that makes sense and be able to balance utilization across your plans. You need to be able to understand, you know, how you increase the, um, you know, the utilization of and realization of your, uh, of your resources versus this you know, bench time that can be perhaps a bad thing, or, or in fact, there are certain types of bench time that may be essential when you need to, to have new skills, you need to train people and, and, and give you the capability to drive new business. So, so that plan, that ability to plan around the resources and the risk and, and, and staffing is really important, and it's a broader picture than just the project. Certainly, it's important inside the project. Uh, execution, keeping your project on track. Uh, you know, delivery, so, you know, making sure that I have issues, that I've resolved those issues, that I, you know, can get a completion sign for the, for the work that's done, that the customer is satisfied with the work, uh, that it meets that statement of work from up front, and that you, you know, you've managed the scope and changes throughout. All that data captured together, and even after, you know, in the post-mortem or post-delivery phase when you want to try to drive more business out of that uh, relationship generally, because certainly, driving business into a client that exists and has a relationship with you is, as long as you've done a good job with your delivery, much easier than trying to build business with new prospects all the time, which could be, you know, very costly from a sales perspective and very time consuming uh, and, and certainly not the best way to utilize your, your uh, relationship and your resources. And then, you know, the same thing is true from the, from the client perspective. How do you tie in lead generation uh, how do you identify, you know, the right prospects to um, to market to and to try to build awareness in? How do I how do I actually you know listen and 
interact effectively and, and sell in what is a really complex, um, you know, trust-based selling process, consultative selling process that it can be very complex and, and can be very time consuming. How do I have the right data around the prospect? How do I, you know, build my relationships there and, and, um, and keep my salespeople really, uh, you know, with the right tools to be able to do that? And then once I get an opportunity, you know, it goes back to that, that proposal system we were talking about. How do I know that I have the capability to do it? How do I make sure it's the right project? And then how do I build a contract that can actually, you know, be uh, a win-win for both of us, for the client and for you, make sure that you're delivering what the client wants, but at the same time, make sure that you are, you know, that you have the capability to deliver and um, and that you can be profitable at that delivery. Obviously, that's the point of, of, of driving growth is profitable growth. Uh, execution, of course, how do I manage the right staffing into the right spot at the right time? Uh, how do I build loyalty with those customers? I said that, you know, certainly you're trying to build repeat business. Most Most of our businesses are built on that long-term relationship with the client once we've managed to build it. So I want to build loyalty. I want to offer good support. I want to make sure I understand the issues and capture them and, and resolve them. Uh, I want to be able to drive next opportunity. I want to be able to capture from my employees that uh, that opportunity that they may uncover while they're there working or, or interacting. Um, <clears throat> and then over time, I want to build advocacy if I can. Obviously, we, we use uh, referenceability in our proposal process quite often and having good solid advocates um, you know it can can be a, a huge benefit to your business so again all of this life cycle tied together uh, and the data collected the data analysis across um, what could be really siloed across multiple systems if it's not managed correctly and then and then lastly the the third of these cycle life cycles um, this this resource life cycle so Again, resources are the core of your business. You know, that is what you sell, their expertise, their capability to deliver these projects. So you have to understand up front, what skills do I need to deliver the kind of business that I know is profitable, that I can deliver, that I want to deliver, and get the right skills. I need to be able to, um, you know, to assess my staff on an ongoing basis and understand how I can evolve them as, the, as you know, business changes. And if you're in Technology, you know, consulting—that's something that happens quite often, right? It's a, it's a, um, it's an evolving space, and your skills have to be current. Uh, and and changes, you know, dramatic changes can happen in those skills over a very short period of time as, you know, technology advances and um, and there are new types of of skills needed. I mean, think of of mobile application development. You know, that's something that's really five, six years ago you would have had almost no. Uh, capabilities in, but now it's an absolutely critical piece from a, a software perspective, and and that's true across all kinds of consulting and, and services uh, organizations as you see these new opportunities. So getting the right staffing, and training, and keeping your staff current, or you know perhaps identifying uh, areas where you really need to go out and add um, skills because you just don't have the capability to deliver the kind of projects you want that you know can be profitable. Um, training and development, these systems often are very disconnected, but again, it's a really important part because it helps define that skills database, that skills list that you use when you're trying to bid the right projects and, and when you're trying to staff people on those projects. So they're very interrelated, but often from a system perspective, they aren't. Um, staffing, soft and hard booking, very important to, uh, to make sure you reserve your resources and get those resources utilized correctly. Not overutilized, obviously, because you have to manage that against your capability to deliver. Uh, and, and really managing your bench time and, and making sure that you're really getting the realization you need from the resources, the assets that you have. Uh, and of course, performance management. I mean, you want to be able to, to have a very open and ongoing relationship with that employee and be able to, to provide rewards and perks when it's, when, it's, uh, when it's there and to be able to provide positive and negative feedback when there is some, be able to connect that to your successful project and, and, and help build that, um, that successful employee who can help you, you know, be more successful from a business perspective and be more profitable. So when I think of this from a system perspective, I, I started calling this services resource planning several years ago, probably six or seven years ago now. And, and what it really is is a different view of, of, of ERP, or now we're starting to call it XRP, um, <clears throat> systems that really capture your capability to manage your entire business across those three life cycles, employee, client, and, 
our resource client and um, and project, and it's project based, so it's focused around your capability to deliver a project effectively, and then it has all the component parts. Now, it's a little more complicated in an embedded services organization than it is in a in a in a full services business, perhaps, because now at least there are full systems that are available out there that that you can implement from a services resource planning perspective that do give you the capability across that entire set of life cycles. And, and give you one version of the truth that give you the capability to manage that data and use that data effectively and manage your people and use them effectively and keep that relationship going with that client. It's integrated front to back uh, and it has, you know, all these key component parts and, you know, everything from opportunity and resource and management down to project execution and then all the way through financials and knowledge management and decision support analytics and, you know, business process automation and collaboration. All these tools are really important, especially when you have a very distributed consulting workforce like most of us deal with. But if you're an embedded um, services organization, you have to take that one step further because often you're negotiating and dealing with an organization that's really focused around products. And for you to manage your business correctly, you need this, this project-centric view, uh, this project-centric system that can really help you get from, you know, what's the right client and, and, and how do I, you know, how do I manage getting leads and getting those into a proposal and getting them closed and, and then managing the delivery all the way down to figuring out what needs to be billed and then getting that into a corporate system that can then send those bills for you. And that corporate system may not be optimized to manage your business. So it can be a very complex set of integrations. Again, both of those need very complete lifecycle uh, capabilities but they may end at different points in that process. In a in embedded, you have to hand that off. You know, much more likely you have to hand that off. So, you know, if you think about just takeaways from this, and then I want to get into a, a discussion, which I think will help us flesh some of these ideas out much more effectively. But what we're looking for is deeper business visibility. We need the capability to get the right data to the right people at the right time in the right context. You know, big data is something we toss around a lot, but big data is not useful to us. Smart data is useful to us. Small data is useful to us. In other words, data in context and in the hands of the right people so you can make good decisions, that's what it's all about. It's about an integrated life cycle approach, not disconnected silos. One source of the truth, obviously, that ties into that idea. Flexible financial management that's focused on maximizing the profits, so a system that lets you find the right business, bid on the right business, close the right business, and deliver effectively the right business while you're finding the right resources and retaining those clients that you can manage, um, you know, profitably over a long-term relationship. You need complete business lifecycle processes, whether you're an embedded service or a standalone service business. You have to have integration across applications and across the data and across people. We have to eliminate those silos so that we can get down to this single source of the truth so we can get this deeper business visibility. And for all of that, it's really a project and resource centric system. So not a product based system, but really focused around the projects and the resources. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, move into a bit of discussion here. And obviously we We'll um, take some questions at the end too. So if you if you have some questions that come out either from what I just presented or from um, you know from the discussion, feel free to to put those in the in the question the Q and A tab. Um, so I'm just going to start this off, and I, I think you know since I have the opportunity to have both a another professional services executive and to have a CFO, uh, I think it's really interesting to talk about the alignment between those, and you know often. Um, that can be um, a, a, a place of, of um, perhaps some misalignment or a place where you really need to make sure there's alignment if you're going to maximize your revenue, your growth, your profitability. So, Sean, I, I want to start with you, but can you give me some thoughts around this? How do you keep uh, alignment between your organization, finance, and the professional services organization uh, and, and really drive that, uh, you know, maximizing profitability and, and growth? Well, th thanks, Michael. Um, you know, alignment between the organizations is so crucial because the, the professional services arm of my business is roughly about 20% of our total um, total revenue, and it's about 80 people. So it's not an insignificant amount of uh, of the resources over here. And understanding what those people are doing on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis is crucial to me because 
it, it, it impacts my financials and my profitability and my P&L so significantly if we don't properly manage the bench um, and we don't properly manage our resources allocation. So, so what we did historically here, and just to give people a little bit of a background, I'm a little bit of a different type of CFO where I'm not an accountant, I'm more of an FB&A professional. Um, so nailing the forecast is kind of important to me and it's near and dear to my heart, but I also know I'm never going to get it perfectly right. I, I joke with my team, I always say I'm just a weatherman. Um, but uh, it, it's important to meet routinely, I think, and to constantly have a consistent conversation and understand where their head's at and me understanding where the, them understanding where my head's at and how that both aligns with the, you know, the grander corporate strategy. So, you know, in the seven years I've been at Navinet, I've probably had, I've probably had 26 meetings a year with my professional service teams, at least if it's on a, on a biweekly basis just understanding the nitty gritty details, what their resources look like now, where they think they're gonna go so we could get ahead of it from a hiring perspective if necessary, or if we have to make um, some hard choices, understand what those are with enough runway to see if we can make some other uh, pivot in the business a little bit to, to protect those resources in the long term. So, you know, it, it's, it's, we can meet, it, it's, understanding, um, it's understanding where everyone's coming from, meeting at a routine basis and a good cadence and really spending some time to, to really understand where both sides are coming from and um, educating. I think that is the third thing I would say when it comes to aligning on this topic where them understanding why their decisions are important to me and how they really impact the grander financials. You know, I think it's to the point where our VP of ProServe over here can probably finish my sentences when I talk about his business and he can finish mine when I talk about, when, when I'm talking about mine. So it's really under, so he understands why his decisions impact my financial statements. Oh, good. Thanks, John. Um, so, so why don't we hear from the opposite side of that and, and kind of think about this from a professional services perspective too, Joe? So I know you know you've uh, you, you like me you, we've been in, in similar roles in our career in, inside of of, uh, of different companies running services, and so. Um, you know, how do you how do you see this? How do you approach getting alignment with the CFO and, and making sure that uh, you have the kind of support you need to to really build, uh, you know, a growth strategy and a and a profitable business? Yeah, hi, Mike. Uh, hey, let me start off um, by responding here to Sean. Um, Sean, you know, you say you met once a week with your VP of PSO. I wish I'd work with you. I used to meet with my CFO twice a day, <laughs> daily at least. Uh, we we were definitely joined at the hip, um, but uh, just stepping back, I, I wanted to take a more uh, high level perspective. To begin with, we really needed to define what was our strategic intent with the services organization. It was really really important, and the way to do that, of course, you, when you when you begin the organization or join a company, you would go around and interview the the executive leadership, the VP of sales, the CEO, head of engineering, and so forth. And the CFO was critical. Because if you're not aligned in terms of your strategic intent, then you've got a real train wreck ahead of you. So basically, typically what you would see is uh, finance people will maybe looking at margins, whereas the services people are totally focused on customer satisfaction, especially when you're bush having in business. So you need to get that strategic intent worked out right up front. Um, and uh, it's not that hard. You don't have to write a book on it. There's actually a book that I collaborated on a few years ago called Tips from the Trenches. Uh, ten chapters on how to run a professional services organization. The very first chapter is totally dedicated to developing a strategy for services. So I mention that because a lot of folks don't think about it. They they jump in, boots and all, and they're looking really at execution. So strategic intent is the first thing. Once you have that alignment with the CFO, for me, and, and maybe I was a weird dude, but I, I found that the CFO became my best friend going forward. Every time we deployed a system for services, we always made sure that it was integrated to the finance system. And, and Mike, in one of your diagrams there, you showed how the project management resource management was built on top of a financial layer. To me, that means you have very, very close integration. Uh, so two things happened. Firstly, the, the finance people found and found finance and accounting people found that they had less work to do. They were getting all this financial information for billing and revenue records and so forth from an automated system, whereas before they were doing it manually. Secondly, there's no question about the system of, re of record. You're totally aligned in each of the meetings. Maybe your sales forecast is not quite in alignment, but with respect to your services revenue and your services forecast, you're speaking from the same songbook. 
So we uh, we always had that alignment, and we became, as, as uh, Sean said, became best friends in terms of finishing one another's sentences. So I strongly recommend you start with strategy and then build your tools so that they integrate together. Thanks. So, you know, I, I would say that from my experience, that's the one um, area, and I, and I, and it was it was my habit up front when I interviewed at a at a company too to to ask that right up front and make sure everybody really could articulate that because I found that that strategy question was most often the place that caused me the most pain down the road when, you know, I thought I was there to make sure that the products worked and the customers were satisfied, but the business really was trying to look at that as a as a way to increase profitability, and and not that they are mutually exclusive, but they're they're different, and they're different approaches to the same business, and can cause a real disconnect if you don't really define that up front and build that into your process and make sure that you're doing the kind of projects that you know either drive that deeper profitability, faster growth, or have some mix across really ensuring that your products are successful if you're that embedded service organization, and that that can be a real conflict and. And can definitely bite you, so that's good. And and integration systems, I think that's also really a, you know a critical piece of it. As I as I said before, that a data silo problem is is always really a, a problem. Um, so 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 Joe, since we're talking about this, let's talk about uh, profitability itself. So, you know, what do you think from you know from your experience? What are the things you can do if if you know your your strategy is to really, uh, you know grow and drive profitability in your organization and contribute to that, you know, to the bottom line from a, a margin perspective, what do you do? What are the, what are the things, what are the, the kind of nuggets that you can give us to take away that can help us really grow profitably? Oh, yeah, great question. And, and this really gets to some profound insights in running services, you know, through uh, trial and error. I, I, I want to start with probably the, 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 the best starting point, repeatable methodology documented, codified, tracked, audited. So what, whatever your discipline is, whatever the practice is, you need to have a methodology that you can then slot your resources into. And then secondly, uh, very close to that, managing your resources as assets. And I find it really uh, astounding that a lot of companies consider their services groups as a, you know, they use this phrase, necessary evil. And I think that's, that's uh, they really malign their folks. Not uh, obviously not the case with standalone services organizations. I realize that, but in a captive services group, the resources are your assets. You need to onboard them quickly, train them, invest in them, and then once you have those two pieces together, it's really managing the details, uh, resource management, all the all the details around managing the bench, uh, tying the right resources, the right tools to the right projects. All these things then give you this, what it refers to as that, that profound control and knowledge on the projects to eke out that extra 15% of profitability. Um, I know from experience, you really can't do this with post-it notes and Excel. And astonishingly, there are a lot of companies that are still trying to do it with Excel. You, you do need an automated system and it's something that's collaborative so everybody can see what everybody else is working on. So those three things, the methodology, the resources, and a good resource management system a key to driving profitability. Yeah, that, thanks, Joe. And, and yeah, I would say that um, you know, in my experience, I've seen uh, all of those as, as really key. You know, the other thing that I and I mentioned this before my presentation, but one of the other areas that I found over over time, really, if you can unlock the data to do this, can really help drive profitability. Is that whole idea of really doing deep analysis around your projects, the post mortem on the project to understand which projects were in fact profitable and why and were successful and why and and really build a profile of the kind of business you want to get and then have your salespeople with it go after that. And on the same side, knowing which business you don't want to get because there's also that 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 business that looks so shiny and attractive and yet you've proven time and again that it's just not the kind of business that you want because you can't do it profitably. So that's uh Anyway, um, so Sean, I'm curious. You now you you have kind of the opposite perspective from us, the the other side of it, I guess. So, what do you think from your perspective? Uh, you know, what do you do to help your services organization improve their profitability? What are the keys from your perspective? Well, you know, I think Joe hit on it really, really where where, where my head's at on this one is is getting away and trying to manage this thing effectively on Post-it notes, on whiteboards, and Excel spreadsheets really is. It's a little archaic, and it, it needs to to really eke out those extra 
extra few points from a profitability or margin perspective, you really need to have a highly integrated solution. And, and, and that's where the, the SRP really worked out, really spoke volumes for me. And, and where I get to, I think back upon your slides you presented earlier, were around the T's and C's and milestones. From, from my perspective as a finance professional, I, I care about, wh hey, wh when can I build these people? And I want to know when I can build these people, when I can start rec wrecking revenue. And, I, you know, if I know a day late, that's not great for me. I want to know exactly when I can do it because the second I get that cash in doors, it's that, it's that much faster I can invest it in something else. Or the second I know that this customer is signed off and we have the checkbox saying, whip, we've received it, I can start that rev rec just, just that much faster. You know, when we didn't have an integrated system, sometimes chasing that paperwork or finding out when to bill something or finding out when a milestone was checked was just that much more challenging. Because everyone's busy. We're all busy. And trying to catch up with people was a challenge. So, I, I mean, that's where this has come, in, come into play and so strong for me. Second, just to kind of play off my points from the, the first topic, it gets back to just managing that bench appropriately. I mean, you can never manage it down to zero. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's a little bit um, aggressive. But um, understanding how much of that bench you have at any given time and what the drain of that bench is on profitability and making sure you're planning for it appropriately, yeah, I mean, that right there, it just managing that cost is so crucial for me. Great, yeah, you know, I, th I think that um, that, that certainly um, that makes a lot of sense from what I've seen around the the, the system view too. And I think, um, you know, that, that you 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 sort of both of you really handed at this idea of uh, visibility and, and integrated data. And I think that's such an important and difficult thing to get to in a lot of businesses. How do I? You know, how do I have the visibility that I really do understand what, when the milestones are defined, when they're met, when I can actually do interim billing or, or billing or recognize that revenue? Um, so transparency that, uh, that an integrated view of the data can really provide to you and can help you really drive um, that business by doing the things that are associated with the, you know, the, the places you are along in that, in that business life cycle. And, and um, you so, just take that a step further. The, the other thing that inter tight integration is allowed for, it, it, I was alluding to the fact that we would have to spend time chasing data for, at, from a human perspective. Mm -hmm. With it so highly integrated, you can actually automate the process. The second things go, you can trigger your rev rec, trigger your billings, and it just streamlines cash flow and profitability so much better. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to, uh, to, to our next topic, and, and obviously this is closely related to what we've been talking about. but. Uh, but, I, you know, I think um, as I've looked at all businesses, not just professional services over the last, you know, nine years of my, you know, research, um, uh, market research career, um, I think that, you know, business has just gotten a lot more complex for all kinds of reasons. Uh, you know, we're inundated with data, um, useful data, and lots of data that's probably not that useful. We have all of the different systems we have, you know, mobile devices we have. Um, of consumerization, which is, you know, had our people bring in other, you know, other things and other systems and, and customers and, and employees have really different expectations. All those things have just led to a complex business environment. But, you know, we really have to cut through that a lot of times and just go, okay, what are the, you know, what are the fundamentals that I need to find growth, you know, grow the revenue, grow profitable revenue, and meet my business goals? So, you know, what... Uh, what do you think, Sean? What do you think from your perspective? How do you cut through that complexity, and how do you get to that uh, profitable growth? You know, for me to get to profitable growth was, you know, I, I like to use the analogy of just wringing out as much water out of the towel as I can while not, you know, overworking folks. So it, it's trying to, to, to walk that delicate balance of maximizing the efficiency of my resources so I can – I, I can build I can build them out even for uh, build them out more and more and you know a tool like an like a like a resource planning tool allows me to do that because it allows me to take advantage of the of the of the shavings of time that might be available for a resource if someone's on a project 75 percent and while before I may not have had really clear visibility into that 25 percent of bandwidth now I can and now maybe I can plug them in somewhere to actually even build that extra 25 percent will not you know, billing them out at 100 or booking them out at 120 percent of availability, something something kind of crazy. Um, so, so that's kind of one thing for me. You know, for me, it always comes back to how do I manage that bench and how do I manage the utilization of the resource team? 
and making sure I can, I'm utilizing them to the maximum efficiency. You know, if I can maximize that, I can drive profitability. As we begin to, you know, here at Navinet, we've pivoted a little bit here where three, three to five years ago, we were a little bit more of a customs pro uh, professional service shop, and now we've pivoted more toward a productized approach. So, so that's been a challenge. And, but understanding that challenge and having real-time data on what that, that resource pull and push and pull looks like has better allowed us to kind of model out in the future of what that product productized approach is going to be amongst that uh, delivery team or that professional service team. And again, wring as much out of the towel there as possible and knowing where we can pull levers uh, left and right when necessary. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Joe, so any anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, Mike. Uh, let me let me start by saying, if your business is growing um, and it's not getting more complex, there's probably something wrong. <laughs> in, I, I, uh, I and, and there are a lot of factors for complexity. But I, from my experience in working, I worked with several startups that actually got profitable and went public. And I can uh, look back and see how the, the business did get more complex simply because we're getting into different practices, getting into different industries. Uh, we're offering more uh, more uh, diversity in the products. And occasionally it could be in, you know, the um, lone wolf salesperson that would go out and sell something we didn't have, which really, you know, set my hair on fire. But uh, I've got to be careful uh, if I, I don't want to malign sales people because I'm actually in sales now, although I came from PS. Um, we have... We have strict rules here. Uh, I do push on a little bit, but no, um, don't sell anything we don't have. But anyway, if everything is, is aligned correctly, your business is growing and it is getting more complex. So be prepared for it. Uh, it it's, it's simply going to happen to you, and it's, it, it's a natural consequence. So embrace it. So how do you deal with that and stay profitable? Well, I want to you go back to the two points I made earlier on. Firstly, is a part of your strategic intent? Are you getting into these other areas? Uh, for example, um, are you doing managed services as part of a, an expansion to your business? Is that, is that part of your strategic intent? Ensure that it's aligned with that. And secondly, very, very simply, uh, resource management. So your uh, front-end loaded consulting folks, the people that are customer facing, they're going to have the, they're going to have to deal with the customer complexity. But in a back office PSO, a lot of the folks are doing the, the back office work and they'd be onshore or offshore. You can share those resources across those different disciplines. So as your business gets complex up front, you can manage profitability by sharing the resources at the back so you don't have to have all these uh, uh, smokestacks of, of organizations. And, and, and now what appears to be a, a, a complex business actually gets more profitable because you're managing your resources effectively. Uh, again, to what Mike was saying, don't try and build that system. Get a resource management system that is collaborative and integrated with your project management as well. Great. Well, you know, you set you set up this next uh, piece of the discussion really well, and and I'm so I'm going to jump right into this because I do want to make sure we have a little bit of time to, to take any audience questions. But I I think this is really important since we've been talking around the technology that helps you enable your business or manage your business more effectively and get, you know, the capability across all three life cycles. How do I, how do I do that from a technology perspective? So what, what kind of advice would you give to, um, to, 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 you know, to the audience around looking for professional services automation or services resource planning, or, you know, depending on what kind of business they are in specifically, uh, what, what kind of technology advice could we give them to, to help them be, you know, get, get their business uh, under, into this profitable growth category? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll, give you, yeah I'll give you a nutshell uh, because we, uh, so it needs just the time. And I'm really just about this, Mike, because I've lived both worlds. It, it, needs, it needs to be cloud-based. There's just no question about it. Uh, and I'm still constantly surprised at how reluctant some people are to go to the cloud or SaaS, and usually they decide security, and that's a valid point, and you have to convince them that you've got the right security. But when I was running services organizations, I didn't have any time at all. None of my people had time to spend on anything that wasn't cloud-based. We didn't have time to install things, configure them, manage them, upgrade them, and so forth. We were just too busy running the business. And if we weren't, then as I said earlier, there's probably something wrong. Once you choose a cloud-based system, then you have a very simple decision to make. Do you want a standalone system, so it's your your, your own PSA that you can manage and all that the change, all, all the change control that you need, or do you want it to be part of the finance system, the, the ERP? 
Uh, and even if it's standalone, of course, it would be integrated to the ERP. So, so that's a choice. For me, uh, I always wanted to have uh, control of my own destiny, so I always went with the standalone system that would integrate with the ERP. And that's what I said earlier, became best friends with the CFOs. But for other folks whose business, uh, their services business is much more closely tied to, say, the general ledger, then they want to, may want to have something that's built into the ERP. Now, after that, uh, sure, there are lots of other integration points. Uh, your, your CRM, just to see what's coming down a pipe, but you may also want to integrate to your customer satisfaction system and so forth. But really, they're, they're the two critical drivers, and I'll start with the, the cloud. With, without that, uh, you're spending too much time on, on automating your, your environment. Well, that's good, and I, I, I took out a – I have a whole section that I often do around cloud adoption, and I can say that, you know, this, we, we've seen the same thing. I think if you're, you know, if you're really looking for quick, for quick value, quick return on investments in a, in, a, in a way to really get those systems up and integrated and operating quickly, you, you have to look at the cloud today. Modern systems are, are cloud-based. That's just the reality of it. Uh, you know, you need mobile, you need all these other things, but the foundation is, uh, is it's a cloud-based system. Um, Sean, how about you? What, what, are you what, would you? what kind of advice would you give um, around the technology selection? Well, you know, I don't want to hammer it home any further, but, you know, cloud-based really was a no-brainer for me, and it, still, it certainly astounds me when I talk to some of my peers at other organizations how few of them are really – or how, how resistant they seem to be, because just purely from a business continuity perspective, it really helps me check that box so that if, for the, when those situations arise. But, you know, to me, it, it's, it's your traditional RFP process, right? Like, you, you go through it, you figure if it's checking the needs. I need, for me, what I believe, and I feel, I, I feel strongly that, you know, the ERP is a first, needs to be a first-class citizen from a business systems perspective, and having that tightly aligned with, a, with an SRP or professional service solution, whether it be tightly integrated or something that integrates smoothly, is crucial because it really helps me a profitability perspective. The other advice I would pass along to everyone is you really need to think about not just what you're doing today, but where you're going to be in five and ten years from now and have that vision and sit back a second before you just take something and plug it in and think, make sure it's going to be architected and configured appropriately to grow where your strategy is growing and making sure those things are aligned. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Kimberly, you want to um, take it back and, um, and and see what questions we have? Yes, thank you so much. Wow, what a great discussion. Um, so first, we had a couple of, of people, Joe, who wanted you to um, repeat the name of the book you mentioned. So if you could slowly repeat that, please. Yes, it's called Tips from the Trenches. And Tips if you can't, it, it's, a, it's listed on Amazon. If you can't find it, just uh, contact me directly. Great. So tips from the trenches, I'm sure a lot of people will check that out. Okay, um, we actually had a couple of questions come in around um, people wondering, you know, when does it make sense to actually look at, um, um, look at putting a, a, a technology system in place for, for the professional services side of the house? People are asking, you know, is it a number of consultants that I have? Is it a number of projects that I'm managing? So, Joe, if you could uh, just mention that like your thoughts on that really quickly. I think we'll start there. So um, go ahead. What, what exactly are they looking for? Is it uh, the metrics for a PSA with respect to resources or projects? No, okay, they're right. looking at, you know, at what point in time does it make sense to actually make an investment in a, in a solution to a, a oh, PSA okay. solution? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I started with uh, 15 people um, way back in 2001. That's when I adopted the PSA. I was dying with spreadsheets. Think about it, 15 people send you a timesheet, an expense report every week, you have 30 spreadsheets to deal with. Um, so I think you can't scale down small enough. Um, if you plan to grow, uh, there's no number of lists too small, but uh, that was my, exp my experience, and we grew to well over 400 people. Okay, great. And then, you know, Michael, I know you've worked with a lot of a lot of different companies, both in the consulting world um, as well as previously in the PS world itself. Do you have any recommendations to add to that? Well, I mean, if you think about when do you need a system, I think that's a um, – my answer to that one has been – always been that you always need a system. I, I don't – I mean, if you're, if you're managing a business, you've got to have some systematic way to do that. Now, you know – uh, do I want? Can I can I live with something that's very limited? When that you know, if I'm if I'm very young in a business, 
I, you know, what I see often now is that that's not the case. If I'm trying to build a business and grow a business um, rapidly and scale it up and, and I want to manage mm-hmm. it effectively, I want those systems in foundationally. I want them in from the start so that I can, you know, capture all the data so that I can use them um, as I need to scale up. And, and, you know, I may start with limited functionality and then increase things as I get more complex. But, but I, I don't think – I think, you know, today – uh, every business has to leverage technology to some extent because that is one of the great equalizers when you think of, of competitive, um, you know, situations and competitive stance and competitiveness. Um, you, you need that you need that edge because you need that integrated data view that lets you make the right decisions even from the start. Great. Okay, and then we have a question that's uh, on a somewhat related note, and I'd like to have Sean start with this question. You know what? Can you provide any tips on how to build a business case around um, around a, a PSA solution? So, Sean, as, as the finance leader on the panel, would love to hear your thoughts to start that discussion. Well, you know, it's funny. They're definitely interconnected, right? Because if you had asked me that first question, I would have said you need that system three to four months, when, you, when, you, when you're finding that you're, the, the person's spending more than X amount percentage of their time, and I don't know what percentage that is, on it, it more tactical work and they're take, being taken away from the more strategic um, work they could be doing or the higher value work. So it, to me that was, hey, we need to maybe add another resource or B, we're, we're, we have, we're, we're experiencing revenue slippage. You know, I don't know if the, the a PSA or an SRP really will – directly drive revenue, but I like to think of it as a tool to, to some extent that helps me helps me put a cork in the bottom of the bucket where the things are leaking out the bottom. And it really firms that up for me so I know, again, I'm getting the maximum I can out of that bucket. And I think that's the pitch. And that's the pitch that came into me. And I'll be honest, I was a little skeptical, at, skeptical of it at first, but then I also sat back and said, oh, my God, I have an entire resource in my organization whose sole job is to try to do this in Excel. What if I could free them up and allow them to spread their wings and work on more higher value work? And it starts coming together like that. And we can start, you can start kind of pulling out the strings there of, the, of the, the value of this, whether it is time to revenue, time to billings, things of that nature. You get maximizing usage of staff. Great. Thanks, Sean. Um, listen, we've got a few more questions coming in. Uh, uh, questions around kind of if you could just maybe tick off, you know, what are some key key metrics or KPIs that, that you should be focused in on the services business? Um, Joe, if you could take that one, that'd be great. Yeah, just quickly, uh, interesting that that question came in. Uh, some time ago, I, I did a survey with the VPs and uh, – I asked them the same question, what are the key metrics? And, again, there's lots of uh, – there are a lot of publications about metrics, and you can spend a lifetime checking them. But interestingly enough, uh, there were probably four or five that were common across these execs, and they were what you'd expect. Uh, there were uh, utilization, profitability, customer satisfaction index, uh, and uh, backlog and bookings, if we could lump them together. So, so – um, Utilization and, and margins were what people were really tracking mostly, and then were they obviously living with the customers because that would help the upsell. Uh, if you're tracking those and you're tracking those in an automated, systematic, systematic way, so that you have objective views of the data, I think you're doing a, a, a pretty decent job with respect to growing your business. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, there's a question here on regarding. I think Sean, this is getting back to your comment about uh, maybe taking a look at your uh, taking a hard look at your processes as you go about um, putting putting a technology solution in place. The question is, you know, how much how much of it, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about how much you know a tool will help you improve your processes, or are the two independent, or how how closely how closely can you correlate those two? Well, there's. I think there's an inherent improvement you get from the tool because the tool likely has some sort of structure. And you're, if you're coming out of where we were, which was an Excel tool, which is highly unstructured, where you could pivot the way you want to calc that, calc 
the process at any given given time, you know, there's some danger there. And the tool, and a tool will definitely put some structure around that. And I think going through the process of thinking through how that structure is going to apply to the way you've traditionally done, done things will give you that self-reflection and will and, and will link to those improvements in the process. I, I know that's not a clear answer, but I, I think when you go through it and you try to put that square peg in a round hole, you really start to think through your process in the short term. And then the long term, it's just linking it back to the strategy of where you think you're going to be and making sure how you architect the tool, if you can't, uh, from a configuration perspective, fits that vision. Great. And then I think to conclude, Joe, I'm sure you've got some, some thoughts around this uh, question as well. Uh, really? I'm just in, in alignment with, uh, with Sean. Okay. No, no additional points here. Great. Okay. Well, it is the top of the hour, and I want to thank all of our speakers today for their time, and thank you on the audience for joining us. I hope you found today's discussion useful. Thank you so much.